Welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 246, and Happy New Year to everybody. This time I'm going to talk about Horace Silver's magnificent album from 1965 on Blue Note, Song for My Father. Uh, what I have here is a very weird little U.S. reissue on the somewhat weird U.S. reissue label Jazz Heritage, which came out in like 1984 with a very poorly reproduced cover. Uh, I think this was around the time when people were basically convinced that jazz was a museum piece, hence this somewhat strange-looking archival release. Anyway, it sounds really good, so strangely enough, I'm not actually in a hurry to upgrade this. Horace Silver is one of the great innovators of hard bop. He was schooled in bebop, but his own contributions to jazz in general are much more in line with some very simple and appealing melodies than was typical of most bebop. In fact, he had a hard time convincing the jazz intelligentsia and the jazz establishment that his simple melodies were commercial at all. One of his earliest hits that he recorded for Blue Note Records, a song called The Preacher, he almost didn't get to record because Alfred Lyon wasn't convinced it was complex enough. But I should be clear that Silver's appeal is not just based on the simplicity of his melodies. His style is imaginative, it's funky, and this record, really, probably his greatest ever contribution, is clever, it's well thought out, and most of the tracks on here have instant appeal. Horace Silver was born in September 1928 in Norwalk, Connecticut. His mom was from Connecticut. His dad, John Silver, or John Silva, as he was born, was actually born in Cape Verde. His parents were musical people, but neither of them had a musical career. His dad was a factory worker. His mom was a maid, but they encouraged young Horace, who started on the piano and the saxophone when he was quite young. He had classical music lessons. His dad would teach him the folk music of his native Cape Verde. At age 11, Horace and his dad happened to be on the sidewalk when the Jimmy Lunsford Orchestra are getting off their bus and Horace sees all these guys, all these musicians heading off and going into this club and he says, Dad, can we listen in? And his dad says, no, no, I gotta get you home. He says, no, 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 just one song. Can we hang around by the door? His dad relents and they actually stay for several songs and from that point on, for young Horace, that was the career he wanted. During his teens, he played both sax and piano. He played sax in his high school band and also gigged on saxophone in local clubs. However, Silver had a physical challenge which interfered with playing the saxophone, which was a slight curvature of the spine, which also in 1946 meant that he was rejected from national service because of this perceived disability. So he switches full-time to the piano. When he finishes high school, he moves within Connecticut to Hartford, where he gets a gig playing at a club. And here is where his career suddenly lifts off, because quite by chance, he happens to intersect with Stan Getz, who's coming through town and needs a backing group, and he ends up hiring Silver's band. Musically, it worked really well. Professionally, personally, it didn't work that well because Getz at the time was struggling with a heroin habit, which meant that paydays for the rest of the band were kind of sporadic. And eventually, after appearing on a number of recording dates for Royal Roost Records in 1950-51, Silver's had enough and he moves to New York. He starts to sit in on some club dates and his style makes a big impression and he very quickly begins to work with some very well-known names, people like Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young. But his first lasting musical relationship was with the saxophonist Lou Donaldson, with whom he appeared on a recording date that Donaldson had with Blue Note Records in 1952. The two of them were booked in to make another record for Blue Note later that year, with Gene Ramey on bass and Art Blakey on drums, but then Donaldson has to back out of that. So Alfred Lyon, the producer and the owner of Blue Note, says to Silver, well, why don't you make a trio record with Ramey and Blakey? This ends up being the 10-inch release, New Faces, New Sounds, on which six of the eight tracks are actually Silver Originals. Blakey and Silver follow this up with another record, another 10-inch made for Blue Note, this time with Percy Heath on bass, which ends up getting released under the title Volume 2. And most of these tracks are actually compiled on a record, a 12-inch record, called the Horace Silver Trio, released in 1956. Silver ends up staying with Blue Note for an incredibly long period of time, from 1952 until the label was basically on its last legs in 1980. Early on, he plays on records by Art Farmer, Sonny Stitt, Miles Davis, Milt Jackson, and he was named Downbeat's New Storm Piano in 1954. That year, 1954, he and Art Blakey also co-found the Jazz Messengers, with Hank Mobley on tenor, Kenny Dorham on trumpet, and Doug Watkins on bass. Now, that group, of course, was long, long, long associated with Art Blakey's name, but the first releases of the group were actually released under Silver's name. Those early records by Blakey and Silver sold extremely well, and they were crucial in the development of what we now call hard bop, an offshoot of bebop, less musically frantic and much more obviously rooted in black musical traditions. As Silver himself said, he'd often felt that bebop players kind of felt it was beneath them to actually play in a funky way. Well, he didn't, to great effect. 
Eventually, by 1956, Silver and Blakey part ways because of the heroin culture in the band, which Silver didn't really want to have any part of. So he creates a new quintet with largely people who had departed the messenger scene for similar reasons. Hank Mobley on tenor sax, Art Farmer on trumpet, Doug Watkins on bass, and Lewis Hayes on drums. His quintet became quite popular. They had hits like Senor Blues, and they had a great reputation as a live act, and Silver becomes much more confident and focused on his own career as a composer, and after 1957, he never appears as a sideman again. The quintet format really suited him, and from 1959 to 1964, he led a completely settled band. This featured Junior Cook on tenor, Blue Mitchell on trumpet, Lewis Hayes or Roy Brooks on drums, and Gene Taylor on bass. And his quintet enjoyed a great run of records during this particular period, including Finger Poppin', Doing the Thing at the Village Gate, Horoscope, Blowing the Blues Away, Tokyo Blues, and Silver Serenade. After five years of this, however, Silver began to feel a little bit stale, despite the fact that the success had been great. And of course, in the early 1960s, a lot of U.S. jazz players had visited Brazil, and they'd come back totally inspired by the new sounds of the bossa nova. So early in 1964, Silver heads down to Rio. He's there for Carnival. This is enormously influential on him, but he also begins to think much more seriously about his own roots and his dad's background and so on, and influences beyond simple American jazz influences. And he comes back ready to shake up his quintet and also ready to start making different kinds of music. And for this new quintet, he brings in Joe Henderson, rising star on tenor, Carmel Jones on trumpet, Teddy Smith on bass, and Roger Humphreys on drums. As I mentioned, Silver had found the whole carnival scene in Rio exciting and musically stimulating, and on his return, he begins composing right away. He's starting to write music with a bossa nova beat, or a close enough approximation of that. But when he listens to the melody of what he's written, he realizes it's not really a Brazilian or a bossa nova style melody. It actually has much more to do with the Cape Verdean melodies that his dad had taught him from the folk music of his youth. So he entitles his first song he's written, Song for My Father. He fine tunes this track along with a number of other songs which he's written. And in October 1964, he goes into the studio along with Smith, Jones, Humphreys, and Henderson to record these tracks along with a track written by Joe Henderson himself. Those tracks were recorded on October 26, 1964, but there had actually been two recording sessions prior to this, which also contributed to this record, which had been made with a prior quintet. On October 31st, 1963, along with Mitchell, Cook, Taylor, and Brooks, he'd cut Calcutta Cutie, and on January 28th, 1964, with just the assistance of Taylor and Brooks, he'd made a trio recording, Lonely Woman. All three of these sessions took place at Rudy Van Gelder's studio in Englewood Cliffs, with Alfred Lyon producing. Side one starts with Song from My Father, with that memorable 1-5 do 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 riff, so memorably ripped off by Steely Dan from Ricky Don't Lose That Number. It's catchy as anything, it's funky, it's danceable, it was a massive hit, no surprise. The Natives Are Restless Tonight is played at a breakneck pace, Humphreys is just playing his heart out in the drums, Jones and Henderson are swapping these incredible solos. This is the version of Henderson who can do a pretty passable Coltrane impression. Then to close the side, we have Calcutta Cutie, again, with the old quintet, not with the new quintet. Although, interestingly, it's his third song in a row. It's got that 1-5 bass ostinato. Side 2 starts with Que Paso, which is the fourth song in a row with a 1-5 bass ostinato underpinning the whole song. There's a little bit of a play on the melody from Nice Work, if you can get it. But in general, the opening of this is really quite ominous with some great moody drum fills. The next track is The Kicker, the only song not by Silver. This one's by Henderson, and perhaps unsurprisingly, it's a bit of an outlier. This is, if anything, something which feels like flat-out bebop played at a million miles an hour. The highlight, I think, is Silver's solo, and the whole band is really swinging underneath him. Then the last track, Lonely Woman, is again made with the old quintet, or only two of the old quintet. This is the trio recording, with Silver's elegant playing underpinned with some really sensitive brushwork by Roy Brooks. This is one of the most famous hard bop records of all time. Ironically, it's one of the last hard bop records to really make a dent in the charts, as that style's dominance, which it had enjoyed for about a decade, begins to fade quite rapidly after 1965. There's no question regarding this record's accessibility. It's hummable, it's danceable, and it's some of the greatest music ever released on Blue Note, which is saying something. It's a must-have for any serious jazz collection, and it's a straightforward 5 out of 5 for me.